Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our most recent webinar, this time focused on venture capital. We hope to illustrate how important venture capital is um, in the role it plays. It's historically been an incredibly successful investment. Um, and of course, the current environment has perhaps made that temporarily a bit more challenging and significant premiums in terms of share price to NAV have moved to discounts. Maybe that means it's a good time to revisit and assess some of the features that might provide support to asset values in times of stress. We certainly wanna give you the opportunity to ask any questions and do please enter these in the chat box you'll find to your right. Now, before we start, um, I do need you to read this risk warning. Um, and I guess it contains truths we would all recognize over the last 18 months. Most importantly, though, I'm thrilled to welcome three leading figures of the venture capital industry. We've got Mark Boggett, CEO of Seraphim Space, Tim Levine, CEO of Augmentum Fintech, and Ben Wilkinson, CFO of Molten Ventures. Not only are they handsome, but well-informed too. Um, thank you all for taking part. And I wondered if you could briefly summarize your extensive CVs and provide some background to your firms. Mark, why don't you bat off? Because you come yes. first in this list. Hi, well, good afternoon, everyone. Mark Boggart, um, CEO and one of the co-founders at Seraphim Space. So Seraphim is a space-focused investment trust, and we're also the most active investor globally in the space tech market, with over 100 um, portfolio companies across all of our space activities. We invest internationally, but the, um, the, the focus of our investment trust is on growth stage space companies. Thanks, Mark. Um, Tim, why don't you go next? Thanks, Nick. Uh, Tim Levine, CEO and founder of Augmentum Fintech, and we are a European fintech focused venture capital fund, uh, typically focusing on Series A and Series B investments in the European fintech ecosystem, currently holding 25 uh, fintechs in the portfolio with a total NAV of uh, approximately 300 million pounds. Over to you, Thanks, Ben. Tim. And thank Ben, you. last but not least. Yeah, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ben Wilkinson, the CFO of Malton Ventures. Um, Malton is a little broader in its thesis, but also investing in technology across Europe in the venture capital space. We back companies that are selling into enterprises, also selling to consumers as the end user. And then we also cover deep tech and hardware. And our final fourth category, as we call it, the pillar, is in digital health. But that also encompasses the investments we've made into fintech, which we have quite a lot in the portfolio, around 20%, and into the space arena, uh, similarly. The portfolio at the moment is 70 companies, and their current NAV value, or their value to our, is £1.4 billion. Pounds, um, and these, the, the area that we tend to invest our capital on, the, the, stage is series a and series b plus and about 80 percent of our capital is going into that b plus which is where we define growth beginning wonderful thank you all and i'm just going to speak briefly to a couple of slides to give some context and i guess the the first thing to recognize is that the venture industry is big and it has grown very very significantly even despite the the fall 22 on 21 that $483 billion deployed in 22 is seven times that of 10 years ago. So a, a, a very significant part of capital formation. Um, and I, I just thought it was worthwhile um, double clicking on the role that venture capital plays in commercializing some of our most important innovations, typically focused on the middle part of that S-curve where the technology is proven, well-established, but the growth rates are still very high. And Harvard Business Review have done some interesting work on this 
evidencing that 80% of the capital that VCs raised allocated towards building the essential infrastructure that young companies need to support growth and to fulfill their full potential. Um, why we're here, one of the reasons why we're, we're here is, of course, because of the problem that we see on this chart, which, which is a composite of the share prices of those three companies who are speaking today against their NAV. And we can see this very clear picture of volatility, both to the upside and to the downside around NAV, which I think clearly speaks to the challenges for public markets in valuing private assets. Now, this has important consequences for you as an investor, but it also, of course, has important consequences for the company's access to capital and how they can deliver their um, strategic plans. So I guess what we want to do today is to think about some of the factors that investors might hope to understand as they attempt to mark to market private assets. And specifically, what are the tools that, that, that these VC investors use to mitigate downside through periods of either financial market stress or economic stress? Um, and, and here we see a, a chart which just shows the typical capital stack most of us on this call will invest in common equity right at the top of that stack or the bottom of the pile, depending on how you choose to look at it. We know that equity gets what's left, either to the upside or to the downside, but typical venture investments are made through preferred equity. And Ben, I just wondered if you could maybe start but, but by helping us understand what makes preferred equity different from ordinary and the benefits that this delivers to you. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I, I think it's an important point and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it further in, in the call about how venture capital manages the risk at the early stage uh, of a company's life cycle. And one of those features is building a portfolio. Another is sitting on the boards of the companies and the governance that, that we have and the oversight we have from that. But also uh, where we sit in the capital stack is an important feature of how we how we manage risk and returns. And looking at the preferred equity, uh, when a venture capital firm invests in a company, let's say at the Series B level, if that company is valued for the uh, sake of an example at 200 million, and they're raising 50 million pounds, we would be investing into that 50 million. So let's say we put 10 million of that round together. The company's value, therefore, would be pre-money 200, post the new money 250. And, and what the preferred equity does is it means that we can be the first capital out. So the value of that company, therefore, can fall from 200 pre-money all the way down to that 50 before the new investors start to have an impact on their cost base. And, and the reason why that is important and, and also a feature of uh, capital investing is that it really gives you downside protection and venture returns are very much skewed to the upside winners. So being able to run your winners along the room and, and accrete that value is a key feature of the model. But also being able to manage your portfolio and manage off, off your portfolio those companies that aren't returning the, um, uh, the upside investment reward that you anticipated when you first made that investment. And what you also see as a feature on the, on the chart here, there's a lot of... Uh, blue lines for debt and mezzanine debt. Venture companies are very much equity backed. They will take some venture debt, which is more working capital bridging. It's not leveraging the investments. And that's an important feature to, to bear in mind. We often find that private equity as, a, as an asset class is, is all tarred with, with the same brush and of which venture capital is a smaller portion of that. But in venture capital, we aren't leveraging returns. So the higher interest rate environment we find ourselves in now doesn't squeeze the equity in the same way as it might do for, for some of the leveraged investments that um, buy out venture capital, uh, buy out private equity would be, would be making. And so the differentiation of understanding that preferred equity stack is, is, is important. Um, what, what that can also mean is that when you're valuing a business and your enterprise values are moving through the cycle, that preferred equity stack would mean that if you own 10% of that company, your percentage of, of, of value or you know, your value at the end of that company doesn't move in line one for one. The, the 
preferred equity will give you that downside protection that means that you, you are able to flex that enterprise value quite substantially. And if you if you relate that across to the current market values for, for, for the businesses that we have, Milton Ventures in this case, we're trading at a roughly 60%, 65% discount to our NAV. But if you flexed all of the enterprise values of the businesses in our portfolio, 65%, the, the value that we hold in them will not fall to 65%. Thank you, Ben. That's really, really helpful. Just, just um, the point that you made on 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 how venture, how that venture capital stack looks very different is, I think, an important one. And I should have said we were just trying to illustrate what a typical company might look like. I guess what 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 you're keen to highlight is that you are typically the purple bars only. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Just those those those. That's right, Nick. I mean, I, I would say that I would, if I was to draw this chart for venture, I would have a very small sliver of blue, dark blue. You see very little mes debt in venture. And really, the fundamental um, capital stack is preferred equity and common equity. They are not heavily leveraged. They're not highly complicated. Um, they're pretty stra straightforward. Uh, as vanilla um, as uh, these things can be, with a little bit of a, a flavour on the top, of course, of the uh, downside protection. And I guess it, it's it's um, consistent with what you've said that 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 as you move through those funding rounds and the characteristics of your business businesses mature, that's when you might introduce a small sliver of blue in in. Um, in terms of financial leverage because some of the operational risk has been taken out yeah i think that's right and i think it's also about maintaining a really strong incentive for the people building the business we are you know we are backing individuals we do not take majority stakes in these businesses so ultimately the idea has to be good but ultimately the execution has to be exceptional and you are reliant on a group of founders and management team who are going to work for an extended period of time, often for salaries that would perhaps um, be at a discount to uh, the market, but with significant upside potential if they can deliver. And you want to make sure that you have a heavenly, uh, a heavily uh, incentivized and motivated management and founder team who will go you know, beyond the call of duty to help deliver success. So you really are aligned with those uh, founders and you're very much reliant on that as a venture investor, despite the fact that you do play a role in helping shape the company in a number of different ways. Just to uh, to put this in perspective um, from, from our, our um, investment, I think this would be typical across venture investors. We would only typically invest into common equity in a seed round. All other rounds, A, B, C, and beyond, would be in preferred equity. So, uh, just to sort of um, make make this clear, our top ten uh, companies that account for eighty percent of uh, our NAV are all invested in, in in preferred equity, and we get all of the benefits that are afforded by this downside protection. Thanks, Mark. That's really helpful. Um, ben, just as a point of admin, I can hear you fine, but a couple of our users are saying that your sound quality is a bit poor. So I don't know if you've got headphones. If not, we can bat on. But 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 um, it's it's just been fed back that that um, your sound quality isn't as the others. Um, Thank you. I'll I'll try and okay. be clearer. Thanks, Ben. Um, Tim, just. Just um, something I was going to link to this really is this idea of maybe the disproportionate voting rights that venture can obtain. Um, this idea of greater control than economic interest and how that can um, help you to influence a business direction at the um, despite you not having a greater than 50% stake, let's say, in terms of strict voting shares? Yes, I mean, I wouldn't want to give the impression that this is about having an outsized ability to control the company when you might own 10, 15, 20%. 
However, you will have um, investor shareholder protections that uh, does not allow often founders or ordinary shareholders to have unilateral ability if they own 50% uh, of the equity to uh, make decisions that wouldn't necessarily be in the interests of those uh, institutional professional investors coming in. And that's incredibly important. It is a journey that you're going on, um, often you know, a, a decade long one, and there'll be ups and downs along the way. It is very rare, and we, typically we would have a seat at the board table, we, we take an observer or director seat, uh, and we would look to work very collaboratively uh, and constructively with uh, founders, with uh, co-investors along that journey uh, to help kind of push the company in the right direction. Of course, there are times on that journey that not everything goes to plan, and you need to make sure that you, uh, as an investor, are protected and have the ability to influence change that you think is in the best interests of the company. The reality is it's often not possible to be unilateral on the other side where you can make that change. But ultimately, if you do have a number of uh, co-investors, <coughs> collaboratively, you can help really kind of influence that change. And that is, is really important as you go on that journey. Um, everything is always as positive as it can be on day one. And, you know, that relationship evolves over time and you hope ultimately you to, to hit a positive exit. But there are kind of many twists and turns on that journey. And it's important to have the flexibility and the ability to drive and influence change along the way. And having those uh, appropriate voting rights um, is, is an important feature. But I wouldn't want to kind of overplay that it gives the venture investors control because that isn't the case. We got it. Understood. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm going to come to Mark now because I shamelessly stole this slide from one of the Seraphim decks because I, I thought it did such a good job of illustrating some of the protections that, 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 that you might have. So, so Mark, it, it, it would have been totally wrong if I didn't invite you to talk about this. <laughs> right. Well, I'm very, I'm very happy to do so. And Ben um, uh, already <clears throat> gave this, um, uh, this example in his narrative. So let me just talk you through what this chart is showing. So there's an assumption of a, of a 50 million investment into a company that's got a 200 million valuation. So that means that the, at the point the investment closes, the enterprise value of that business is 250 million. So uh, if time goes on and that enterprise value increases, then the purple line there shows the extra value that accrues to the investor in that 50 million. However, um, if um, uh, in markets like we are at the moment, the enterprise values are falling, then this chart shows what happens in, in, in those circumstances to the left-hand side of that 250. So, for example, the way that we value our, uh, our companies on a quarterly basis, where there's not been a funding round for the last year, we'll do a calibration exercise against other alternative assets, which might include listed assets. So that means that the enterprise value could uh, fall from that 250 when compared against listed uh, listed assets. So let's say, for example, for the purposes of this discussion, that the enterprise value falls to 125 million. So it's halved in value. Now you can see that the uh, the, the the line there um, is is fixed at one, the multiple return one. That's because that 50 million pound invested sits at the top of the preference stack. So uh, provided that, um, that, com that the company um, uh, enterprise value is in excess of 50 million and that there's no debt in the business, the first money out of the business will be the one times return on that preference stack to those investors. So the value of that business at, um, at this 125 million, the actual uh, change to the, uh, the fair value of that holding is uh, there is no change. It's still valued at 50 million. And it's got some considerable distance to go um, before um, it would start to be impaired below 50. You can see there in the chart as, uh, as it falls away to zero, as the uh, enterprise value fall, falls below. So that, that is the way that uh, the preference stack protects the value in the event of, um, of, of moving um, the valuation at the enterprise level. So let me uh, just give you a sort of real life example of, uh, of this in our, our recent interim results. We indicated that from our, our top 10 companies, four businesses went down 
two businesses went up and, and all of the others were flat. So the enterprise value actually fell by 15% across the board of all of those uh, companies. But the fair value only actually fell by 3%. And that was because of the protection that was afforded through the liquidation preferences, as we just described there. So that's a real life example of how these liquidation preferences work within our portfolio. I might, I might and I guess I, I knew, Mark, that, that, that... Sorry, Ben, go on. No, I was sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to layer on to that. Um, but venture capital is very much a portfolio approach to investing, as I said earlier. If we look, for example, over the last seven years since Molten Ventures has been a public company, we've realised cash returns back to the balance sheet of over 450 million. And if I break down those returns, around 45% of our invested capital has returned multiples of 3x plus. So on the on the chart here, you'd be on the right hand side and you'd be dealing with the upside in those companies. The remainder of the capital, which is clearly over 50% of what we've invested into, is delivering in some cases less than 1x, but in most cases it will be one to two X type returns. And that's because this preference stack gives you that downside protection. So as a feature, it's very important for venture firms to protect the downside and ensure we can recycle capital into new investments and create new vintages. And the skill of a venture capital uh, investor is therefore to pick the right timing to move on those companies that aren't going to give you the three X plus returns. No, and, and you know, I was just going to double click on something that Mark said, Ben, and, and then I, I think it's interesting to pick up with um, the other guests on what you've just said, too. The, 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 the first was just that I knew this existed. I hadn't realized it was quite as extreme as it is in terms of the downside protection that it offers. So it, it, it's really interesting to pick that out. The, the, the other thing, I guess, was was just to ask both Mark and Tim whether the distribution of of returns that Ben's just spoken about. Do we think that's similar across venture or does is it really dependent on the sectors that you're investing in, in terms of those numbers that deliver vast, vast multiples and then those others where you're trying to um, salvage capital in order to uh, recycle? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say that it is somewhat stage specific rather than subsector specific. So I'm trying not to get too technical in terms of structure, but one of the um, dynamics of preference shares is that you can have different classes of preference shares. So it's similar to your stack. If you came in at the A round, you'll have A shares and you come in at the B round, you've got B preference and goes all the way up. So if you have put in 10 million in the B round and 5 million in the A round, but there was 50 million in total in the B round and the business sells for 50, you get the 10 back, but you don't get the five. So you've got to kind of layer that on top. So, you know, I think preference shares are absolutely a feature that gives you downside protection, but often the devil is in the detail. And I think it's always quite hard for investors in funds to have that um, transparency to really understand the granularity um, of each uh, underlying asset. I think it's fair to say that almost all uh, venture investments have features of downside protection, but uh, different companies will have different flavors depending on the stage. And in a market that we're going in now, uh, whereas a year or two um, ago, it was quite hard to offer what I would regard as more exotic or investor friendly terms. It was very much a founder's market. We're now moving towards an investor market and you might well get far more attractive uh, terms where you wouldn't get a one times liquidation preference. You might actually get two or three times um, of that initial money uh, to really incentivize that investor to come in. I think the counter argument to that is you don't want to create a structure that's really punitive um, to the um, founders, to the employees, and also to investors looking to come in at that next round and say, that's a bit of an exotic cap table with lots of features and terms that doesn't really make it straightforward. And that can really disincentivize that next phase 
uh, of investment coming in as well. So, you know, it's important to look forward, not to be greedy, uh, but at the same time to uh, adjust to the market conditions. And we are moving into a, uh, a market that is going to be far more investor friendly than it has been in 2020 and 21. Yeah, there, there are. That other... makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, sorry, Mark, go on. I was going to say, just to complex, uh, just to add to the complexity, uh, there are other downsize measures that are routinely taken as well, um, in the form of uh, anti-dilution. So uh, I don't know when the right time to go into that is, Nick. Um, but uh, now's a good time. Now now's would be a good, a good time. time. So uh, we've just talked about uh, liquidation preferences and how they can um, preserve your return. Um, when the enterprise value is declining. Um, there is an, another downside protection um, that we routinely take on all of our investments, which is called anti-dilution. So, uh, so what this does is when the, uh, there is a future funding round that is done at a lower share price, uh, you get issued with um, new shares at par that effectively um, um, make up for the dilution that you're suffering because of the uh, the repricing uh, of the shares at a lower price. Now, there's there's numerous different flavors of, uh, of anti-dilution. Um, and, uh, and what I just described there is the best case. Um, most cases are uh, weighted average, which means that you get somewhere between 20 and 50% of the, of the downside covered by these anti-dilution shares so that you get issued uh, additional new shares in the in circumstances where uh, there, there is a lower share price in, in, in later rounds. So just to put this into perspective again, um, in terms of um, our own fund, um, uh, it, it, all of the top 10 companies, the private companies in the top 10, have both anti-dilution and preference shares. So it's, uh, it's really belt and braces in terms of the downside protections for the types of markets that we're in at the moment. And this is one of the issues at the moment as to why the public market investors just cannot quite understand why the NAV that's reported quarter after quarter by the, by, by the venture funds is so robust. And yet the uh, prices that they're seeing across the rest of the market have, have been falling very heavily. And it's because of a combination of these two downside protections that we're able to continually report robust uh, NAV in these challenging times. No, that's that's really really helpful, and 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 maybe we'll 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 move off now some of these more technical features, which which I think have been really important to bring out. And I guess that the the one of the easiest pieces of analysis for investors is to look at listed companies that might look a bit like some of your underlying companies. Many of those may have de spacked and be listed on NASDAQ and to look at the performance of their ordinary equity um, and not make judgments, I guess, both about the quality of the business, but the characteristics of the equity which has gone in to form that, that um, capital stack. And I've, I've certainly learned quite a lot about um, how we should be very thoughtful in terms of the protections that you guys present and deliver. Um, something I was gonna come on to, I guess, from, from almost an investor protection perspective is in VC, and, and, and this chart here, the, the, the vertical lines just show the dispersion of returns, the divergence of returns, both by net IR and annualized return across different asset classes. And I guess it was very striking to me how wide the venture capital piece was. And therefore, obviously, one of the conclusions from that is that the manager selection piece becomes much more important than if you were buying taxable bond mutual funds. And I guess that, 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 that all of you are, are um, managed funds that have got um, real heritage and have evidenced your process. I wondered if, 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 if you could say a few words on why this dispersion exists in this sector more so than elsewhere. Um, and 
how your process has been delivered to ensure that that that, that you stick um, where you want to in terms of that return and risk profile. And maybe I'll start with Mark, but but I would invite commentary from from Ben and Tim also. Yeah. So uh, you know, happy happy to address this. Yeah, it, it is all about manager selection uh, in venture capital, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, Nick. Uh, what tends to happen is that the, the, the managers that have got an historic strong track record are able to continue to maintain a good record going forward. And this is because um, venture capital is hard. You, you learn by making mistakes and you alter your processes um, and investment strategy to sort of take account of those things that have happened in the past. So you really find a way that really works for you and for the team. And, and pattern recognition is a really important thing about identifying the right founders to back and how you support them and which co-investors that you want to bring on board alongside you. So um, our, our track record um, in, um, in the private venture market is top decile. We've, we've, we've returned cash returns of 49% IRR. And um, we, we are continuing with the same strategy um, and, and deployed through our listed fund that has um, enabled us to deliver those kind of returns in the past. So we're confident in the processes that we have in place, our ability to be able to originate the best deals in the market, work with the best founders. But when times are difficult, the way that we structure these investments really comes to play. And this is the reason why we've been focusing on the downside returns um, in, in this market. So it is all about manager selection and it is all about backing those that have got demonstrable track record. Tim, is it worthwhile just 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 um, saying a tiny bit on, on, on why you might think why it might be that those returns are so wide? Is it that the companies that an early stage of development just have very wide outcomes. And therefore, you know, if you get it wrong and you haven't structured it right to Mark's point, then it is very wrong. Yeah, I, I think that's a good characterization. I mean, we're in the business of taking risk and every venture fund that performs in the top quartile, top decile needs at least one outsized return. I mean, we all, target a single asset that could be that fund returner. Uh, and ultimately that's our objective. If we are not backing businesses that ultimately fail, it's my view that we're not taking enough risk. But what you need to make sure that you do is the ones that do pay uh, for the ones that don't work more than pay for that and deliver um, that um, you know, double digit, 20, 30% ultimately, um, you know, IRR. And I think that's really important. So we are looking to back exceptional founders with exceptional ambition. But at the same time, the earlier you are taking on that um, risk, um, you know, the higher the probability that that is going to fail. So it's really important, one, that you structure your deals in the right way, which we've talked about um you know, at length, but also that you have the right portfolio construction, uh, you have access to um, the deal flow where you feel that you are seeing the very best opportunities in the market. We've talked a little bit about pattern recognition, but that is extraordinarily important. And I often talk to family offices who say, well, you know, I could invest in you, but I think I'm going to go direct. I don't like paying fees. And, you know, that is in many respects, a very short-sighted um, uh, approach, because ultimately, I often say, well, how many fintech opportunities have you seen over the past year? Uh, and of those, how many have you ultimately invested in? And, you know, rule of thumb, maybe they've seen five, less certainly than 10%, and in some cases, 1% of the opportunities. And when they do see a compelling opportunity, which is rare, what are they bringing to the table? Do they have that portfolio? Do they have that capability to really um, share learnings uh, and leverage um, other companies in the portfolio? And more often than not, the answer is no. And, you know, I think it's the same for retail investors who are looking to, you know, sometimes crowdfunding platforms where they can get access to, um, you know, compelling 
um, fintech or tech opportunities. I, I think you know there are, and we we back one many many years ago, which we recently exited. But I think part of the challenge there is they are not getting the same protections that the venture investors. So they don't uh, necessarily receive the liquidation preference or the anti-dilution. They're coming in as ordinary because they're structured under EIS or SEIS. So uh, again, I think this is another reason to really think hard that if you do want diversified exposure to an emerging asset class, such as space tech or venture or FinTech, then it really is worthwhile um, looking at that um, you know, manager and seeing if you feel that they are getting access to the very best deal flow and they do have that selection mechanism and historic track record that can give you real um, cause for comfort. Thanks, Tim. And I guess that, Ben, there's an interesting thing about venture, isn't there? How, how although we're highlighting the dispersion here, there's also much more persistence in fund returns, in, in generating strong returns, from funds in venture and and um, and also private equity, I think too. And I, I guess that maybe just picking up on some of the things that Tim said, that's about both the access to that deal flow, so that the funnel is very wide, but there's also something about having the resource to filter deals too, which which presumably. Um, is only truly effective once you're of a certain size and scale? Uh, I would say that that's true. I think the, the points that Mark and Tim made are very accurate there about the characterization of the managers in the industry. Um, the access to the right deals is crucial and you need a brand for that. You need recognition. You have to win your deals by persuading the founders that you can add value to them. And that comes from your pedigree and your track record. Um, and therefore you win the best deal flow. So in that sense, it becomes self-fulfilling with, with that, that, that size, scale and track record. I think it's also true that um, because it's a, a minority investment, it's a syndicated investment uh, amongst other managers. So if we're 10% in, in, a, in a company, you'll have three or four other venture capital firms around the table. And being in that network and being perceived as one of the uh, funds that um, others would want to syndicate their deals to also increases your ability to, to drive returns and see the best deals in the market. And I think that dispersion of returns is also a reflection of different vintages. So the important thing there is with venture is, is being consistent to invest across years and cycles is a, is a phrase which I like, which is you, you can't really time venture, but the time in venture is what is important. And that consistency of, of, of track record is therefore something that people should look for because there are technological shifts that occur and, and certain vintages will be will be stronger than, than other vintages. So you have to play across that longer term. We tend to be invested in these companies for five, seven plus years. And, and so it is a long term game. And, and therefore, the dispersion across the portfolio is important. Um, the maturity of your companies, but also the different subsectors that they play in, because in, in truth, you don't know in five, seven years time, which of those subsectors is going to be performing strongly. So I think all of those are key factors. And, and to the point in your question about scale, you do need to be able to triage those companies through. You do need to be able to manage those board positions in, in the right way. And you need to be able to keep the quality bar of what you do high. And so I do think that having capital to deploy across the cycles, having capital for um, uh, existing portfolio, but also creating new new investments and, and having the resources to, to um, have a good, strong team behind that investment team, but also the, the non-investment functions um, that, that come with the need for compliance and for managing your the execution of your deals and portfolio management. So I think that's absolutely true, but it is, why you will see consistent outsized returns in the best managers. Can I just uh, chime in on Thanks, that just to add, to, to add one more yeah, point yeah, please, if I may, Nick? I think um, there's, a, there's a couple of points I'd like to just add to that. Uh, what, one is also the, the stage that, um, uh, that VC investors invest. So you get, you get funds that are just focused on seed or you get funds that are focused on Series A or Series B and they're focused on, on stage. And that can often leave um, these funds um, at risk because um, they're reliant on another group of investors coming in behind them. 
So where you have uh, investors like Molten uh, is a good example where they're able to invest at seed and series A and series B and series C and beyond. They, uh, they can take a longer term view in supporting um, companies. Uh, and that is, that is something that the entrepreneurs that, um, uh, that you're investing into you know, hold um, uh, uh, and consider to be very important to have an investor that can follow um, through subsequent rounds. Seraphim is the, is the same. We're backing companies across all stages. But one, one of the, uh, the other considerations is about um, sector specialization. Um, so uh, we've got uh, Tim with FinTech, we've got us with, with Space Tech. And that gives another element of, uh, of expertise within a particular area. You've narrowed down the field that, um, that you're prepared to invest into, but you've got a deeper understanding of, uh, of, of those businesses. And you also tend to see as a consequence of that, more of the available opportunities in that market. So over a period of time, because of that privileged position, the, the, the investor builds up a information asymmetry over the different companies that are, um, that are raising money in that market, that are competitors in that market. I think Tim made the good point about um, individual investors seeing you know, one or two or three um, deals um, out of 10 or 20 in a particular market during the year and making a, uh, making a decision around that small sample. Whereas the specialist investors get to see across the market and then select which company they think is the best fit for their, for their fund. And I think that there is a, a real advantage on that. And I think that um, if you look at the performance of, um, of sector-focused funds, you can see the, the benefits of that coming through in this historical performances. Now that makes um, perfect sense, Mark. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to Q&A now. And, and um, just to reiterate the opportunity for um, the audience to put comments into the chat or the Q&A, and I'll triage those. Actually, Mark, um, a question from, from Ben, which is linked to one of the answers that you just gave, is, is, is um, if you invest in Series A, how do you prevent your investments from being diluted as the company raises further? And I, I think that you gave a pretty comprehensive answer to that. But the answer, I think, is you can choose to follow or otherwise. And therefore, you have that protection because of your ability to follow through the series. Well, that, that's one of the ways that we protect ourselves. The, the other one is really just having a, a discipline around valuation. Because we recognize that uh, we're only investing you know, part of the money that a company will require in order to get through to profitability. So you need to really think about the next round. What's the valuation of the next round? What's the size of the next round? So if the round that you're investing into, which might be the A round, is overvalued, then the business has to achieve an awful lot um, with the money that you've provided them to justify a high-priced B series. So this is where the discipline around valuation is really important. And actually, it's where a lot of, um, uh, of, of, of um, less experienced managers fall over. We're prepared to walk away from transactions where the valuation is just too high because of these knock-on consequences of, um, of issues further down. Whereas a less experienced manager who's fallen in love with a team or a technology really uh, doesn't have that discipline around valuation. So I think a discipline around valuation and, and then in addition to that, the ability to be able to participate in later rounds is really the, uh, the, the, the path to success in venture. Got it. And maybe, um, Tim, there's, there's, a, there's a question from Giovanni, who's interested in, in what some investment trusts have been doing around share buybacks, um, given the extent of the discounts that exist in certain areas. I guess I'd like to slightly widen that and turn it into a question around capital allocation. How do you choose in this environment to increase the capital deployed with existing companies to fund new investments in the context of maybe some of these terms and opportunities getting better, as you hinted at earlier, versus the opportunity to buy back your own stock when you're buying shares that companies that you really that you know well at an effective discount? Sure. I mean, I, I think always where we are in a world of, I would say, unprecedented discounts. Um, 
the the range of between 35 and 65 and i think some even even more is pretty extraordinary so i think it does present a, a pretty unique opportunity both for uh, investors but also for the trust themselves to really look hard at why they're trading at a discount and if they do have what i would regard as sufficient capital because ultimately you absolutely need to ensure you've got sufficient capital to defend your portfolio not to be taken advantage of to make sure that they have the capital they need to thrive and i think you know if you do have that then i think it is fair to say that boards and a manager will sit there and discuss the merits of you know a buyback and if it is accretive and i think at these levels for most trusts uh, a buyback would be accretive and you have to carefully balance that with the desire to deploy further capital both across your portfolio and to capitalize on you know new opportunities in what we think will be a far more favorable market towards the end of this year <clears throat> and throughout next year and uh, beyond so i think there is a delicate balancing act ultimately and i think I, i'm sure i speak for uh, you know, Ben and, and Mark as well. When we looked at our portfolio 18 months ago, and we saw that the um, air was being taken out of the market. The first question was, how well funded are our portfolio companies? What is their cash runway? What can be done to extend it? Do they need to grow as quickly as they were? Are they going to get credit on, uh, for that? Or could they grow at 100 instead of 150%? and extend their runway from 18 months to 24 months. I think that was a really important exercise that most high quality venture managers undertook across their portfolio over a 12 month period. And I think once you have real certainty and comfort that your portfolio where it can be is really well funded, has sufficient runway, you then focus your um, you know, deployment strategy on, well, what else is out there in the market? When do we think we are gonna deploy? When do we think we're gonna be next able to raise money in the capital, you know, in the capital markets, public markets, and does it make sense to step in um, to um, obviously uh, ensure our shareholders that want to hold on to the stock are benefiting from a buyback? So I, I think there is, you know, a lot of debate that's been going on around investment trust boards, not just in venture, but in private equity as well. Um, and of course, shareholders are fully um, aware of any buybacks because that gets disclosed at, at the end of each day and um, those that follow momentum will know that we have been very actively buying back our stock we are well capitalized at the moment we want to ensure that we remain well capitalized but at the same time at these discounts we feel uh, and the plc board because it's the plc decision feel that it's a pretty compelling opportunity to be buying back in this environment uh, but it's one that is constantly under review Mark, Ben, because this is such an interesting topic, um, I'm just curious as to whether you've got anything to add or whether Tim's um, mirrored what you would have said. Uh, I think in my case, it, it's, it's, it's summarised that very well in terms of the decision-making process. Uh, you do need to be well capitalised and ensure that you have sufficient funds for your, your existing portfolio and protecting your fair value in that portfolio. That the discounts that we're seeing in the public markets are unprecedented and, and therefore we've, we've said in a similar way that in realizations that come through if we feel we have sufficient capital we'll buy back our shares um, i think everybody recognizes that share buybacks play an important part in signaling and also there's the mechanical aspects of, of reducing the number of uh, shares in issue and, and so should improve your share price but it has to come alongside further momentum in, in the broader market and i, I, I think share buybacks alone from a, from a company aren't going to change the direction of, of travel. It will come from macro stability and, and some degree of um, allocation to what's perceived as more risky areas of the market again. Um, but I do think calls like this are important to explain to people that we manage that risk in the, in the portfolio. So actually the, the risk is managed by playing across the asset class. In the case of Molten, we invest at the seed stage in 75 managers across Europe. So we get a really clear view of what's happening in the market and the best companies coming through. And then we allocate 20% of our capital at the A stage with 80% going to that later stage. So you're naturally triaging that risk. So I think the, the public market view of 
this being risky and every time there's some slip up in the macro world and, and we all get sold off, it, it's not really the right reflection of uh, the underlying investment case. So I think it's very helpful for us to be able to spend time like this at educating the market in that way. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, Nick, uh, you know, I agree with everything that has just been said. Um, we have been looking at our discount, which is which is very much aligned with our peer group. So we, we've concluded that, you know, it's not about Seraphim. It's not about our space strategy. This is a, a, a macro uh, discount that's been driven by macro considerations and that will recover um, as sentiment recovers. So we've got $50 million left um, in, in, in cash that we're reserving for supporting the portfolio and for selectively making new investments. Investing at the bottom of the economic cycle is really the best time to be making new investments. So we're maintaining our cadence of making new investments. We've been working really hard with the portfolio during the course of the last year, and the portfolio is now very well capitalized. And you know, we've been reporting on many funding rounds. We've been giving indications around the sort of how the valuations have been holding from the previous year to try and help investors understand what's really, really going on in that market and, uh, and, and helping the investors themselves compare that against these huge unprecedented discounts that we set out. Thank you. And, and, and just to double click on this, really um, leaning on a question from, from Tim, who asks whether communication between managers and the boards um, become more frequent at times like this when the discounts look so wide? I, I, I guess that this is about governance and, 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 and how the board supports you as managers through, 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 through a period such as this. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the decision to buy back is the, is the board's call. It isn't the manager's call, uh, certainly when it comes to uh, an investment trust. And so ultimately, our job as a manager is to focus on, one, ensuring our portfolio companies have the support um, and resource that they need from us, and also that the team is focused on identifying the very next best cohort of uh, companies where we can deploy more capital, um, but recognizing that we are publicly listed and share, you know, share price return is really important to investors. NAV return is all well and good, but if you're trading at a 40, 50% discount to NAV, then investors ultimately want to see that appreciation. Of course, we are in a very difficult market period. And uh, as such, we, you know, feel very strongly that we will recover um, from this and quality will, you know, come through and we will um, soon return to trading at par and hopefully a premium again, which we were um, just over a year ago. But at the same time, you know, you need to recognize that you sometimes need to react. So, yeah, I mean, I, th I would imagine that all investment trusts have a good level of frequency of engagement with their with their PLC boards. They have kind of limited areas of focus. And this is one of them uh, and, and one where they do spend a fair bit of time. Um, personally, from my point of view, I'd love to be holding on to all my capital uh, to ensure that we can deploy it in the next cohort of great companies, um, but also recognizing that there's a, there's a balance to be struck there. Just to, just to uh, chime in on that, um, our board have encouraged us to be more uh, communicative um, with the market. So we've actually moved to producing a monthly newsletter to try and really give um, the market an understanding of exactly what's going on within the portfolio so that um, investors don't have to wait for a quarter to, uh, to, uh, to understand what's going on. So we've been doing that since the start of the year and it's been, it's been very well received so far. Yeah, maybe Thanks I just- Mark. That's really helpful. Maybe, maybe just touch Sorry, on some, on. touching on some of those themes, the, um, the governance point, um, we, we moved ourselves um, onto the main market with FTSE 250 listed is governance within the structure of, of, of the board in, in a similar way to, to, to Mark and, and Tim will have as well. And I think for public market investors, that is a, an added benefit that, that, that they get beyond the access to what is a very difficult market to get exposure to. And um, I, I think the discounts that we're seeing to NAV right now are even more profound because actually there's no value being attributed to the, to the managers. In, in our case, the manager is held by the balance sheet structure. It's a subsidiary of the PLC. And so a investor in Moulton is, is effectively getting a look through 
into the underlying investments without the without the fee drag because we have income coming from from other areas. So those discounts are very profound as it stands right now. But I think it's also worth us pointing to the upside case. We focus very much on the protections and the, the downside because of the state of the market that we're in right now. But the upside case is that there is increasing um, technology um, emerging in, in markets. The, the um, disruption that that's bringing is continuing. That pace of disruption is continuing. If you look at all the subsectors that are in our portfolios, whether that's space or fintech, or whether that's quantum computing or, or, or blockchain technology, all of these areas, uh, cloud native technology, all of these areas are disrupting markets and creating efficiencies in markets as we transition economies. And I think it's it's good to finish on that upside case of, of, of what people are really investing in and why they should be excited about the space. No, thank you, Ben. Um, there's maybe time for one more question and, and it's come from Matt. Um, who asks, in periods like this, do you conduct your valuations with extra rigor? Mark, why don't we start with you? Uh, yes, um, absolutely. Um, you know, we, 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 we traditionally would value our business at the price of the last equity round. These businesses are raising money on an annual cycle, and that's a really good gauge, typically because there's also other third-party investors they're investing at that same price. Because of the, um, uh, the gyrations in pricing in the market, we've now moved to a, um, uh, when um, uh, valuations are, are more than a year old, we move to a, a calibration exercise. So we, we then look at a basket of alternative valuations to determine whether the enterprise value should be adjusted. So that's both in terms of comparing against uh, equivalent market listed companies, but also taking into account the performance of the underlying companies relative to uh, their, own, their, own, their own budgets. So yes, we have introduced a, a new measure um, just to make sure that there is some sort of realism um, coming into those valuations. But it goes back to the point where we first started, which is this is about how you're adjusting the price of the enterprise values of the companies within our portfolio. There's another layer of assessment then, which is the downside protections. And it's through the application of those, the anti-dilution and the, and the um, liquidation preferences, that ultimately the, the adjustment in fair value has been uh, you know, very, very, very limited um, uh, during the course of the last year. And that's still one of the things that the market's really struggling to reconcile, why these um, prices just haven't fallen stone like some of the companies have in comparable um, equity markets yeah, yeah I mean I think so, that's, so uh, that's yeah that, that is really important and I and I think the liquidation preference is something that we all collectively have tried to communicate really effectively to the market and it isn't something uh, that is always um, particularly easy to understand uh, we have it with a number of businesses and we try and give the example that the last round was 20 million at a valuation of 200 and our contribution to that round was seven and a half million and we hold it at the liquidation preference so the company would need to drop 90 percent in value for us to write it down and yet during our investor roadshow we still get kind of questioned about why did you invest in that business at a 200 million valuation as they were holding it at the liquidation preference so i i think all um listed venture capital and private equity has really doubled down on trying to articulate the valuation process, which I wouldn't say wasn't rigorous before it was, but it's about articulating that rigor in a better yeah. way and being more transparent. And that's a really important feature. The other thing I would say is if you compare listed venture to more traditional venture, a GPLP closed structure, there is less incentive for that traditional GPLP structure to re uh, rewrite its valuations because ultimately no one is looking at this on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis. Investors will ultimately get their money back uh, with a return or not. And if you look in the secondary market for these uh, GPLP structures at the moment, we're seeing deals trade at 20-30% discounts to what we would regard as inflated, already inflated valuations that haven't taken those write-downs. I think if you look at the listed markets where we've got much more transparency, 
where we have been using public market multiples, liquidation preferences to really bring our portfolio valuations uh, to be more reflective of the market conditions. And yet we are trading at 40 to 50 percent. Uh, so we're seeing trades that what I would regard significant premiums to where we're holding them on portfolios, arguably that haven't taken the pain that many of us have in terms of uh, adjusting our uh, valuation multiples. And I think that's been a really interesting kind of benchmark for us as we've kind of seen some of those uh, trades complete in the last few months. And I think we'll, we'll, see, we'll see more of that. Maybe later on, two, two points to that. Um, the the IPEV guidelines that we all follow, which is international private equity venture capital guidelines, are consistent in the approaches that you have to take. And so an investor wouldn't see disparities between the, the approaches that, that we take. We, we, uh, we're ensuring that we're calibrating to public market movements and therefore taking those, those downward movements in EV uh, alongside. And so all of our results are published. I think the investors can see that we've, we've flexed those valuations in line with the markets. Uh, the other point I would make is that ultimately the proof comes from those companies raising capital at previous round values that support those round values or, or even in a top list to those. Uh, we're, we're fortunate today that one of our core companies, Ledger, has announced a new equity raise, uh, Series C raise that has supported its previous valuation. And I think the more proof points we get of that, that's going to help the, the perception in the market. And then your ultimate validation is always realizing those investments above the value that you have them in the books. And we've got a consistent track record of doing that and and keep keeping keeping on proving those points is, of course, what investors really need, need to see. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to call time. I'm conscious of both your time and that of um, the audience, but maybe if you've got any closing remarks, we could dance round. So, Mark, why don't we start with you, just if there's anything else that you'd like to add or to summarise with. Yeah, I just reiterate a point that I made, and I think this is true for all of us on the call, that the discounts that we're suffering at the moment are across the board. The, these are um, discounts that are across our peer groups and across other categories. Private equity is suffering you know, almost as much as venture. So, so these discounts aren't about the particular manager. They aren't about the particular strategy. It's, it's about private companies and a, uh, the uncertainty of how they're valued. This is what um, we're, we're suffering at the moment. I believe that we are, at, at when sentiment returns, the, the entire market, the peer group, will just see a, 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 a closing of that gap um, right away. So we're focused on business as usual. There's plenty of opportunity. There's nothing we can do about our valuation discounts at the moment. We're just keeping our head down, and making good investments that will come through in our value in the future. Thanks, Mark. That's really clear. Tim. Yes, I think echoing a lot of the sentiments that have been made already, I think it's a, an exciting time to be a retail and institutional investor um, in the public markets, in particular in private assets and investment trusts because we are seeing unprecedented discounts and i think it's a great opportunity for investors to go away um, and you know really do their homework because not all discounts are equal and yes it is absolutely uh, an industry-wide issue but at the same time i think there is there are some very compelling cases as to why some discounts um, are there and I think there are others where it really doesn't feel um, uh, particularly reasonable or fair and I think that is where uh, the opportunity presents itself and you know as, as a retail investor myself when I'm not doing the day job I think it is a really exciting time uh, to look under the hood a little bit more uh, and I think um, you know we all disclose a lot more information uh, in our, um, you know, either quarterly or half yearly results. And that's a great opportunity to really you know, dig in and see whether you know, these are asset classes that you want to build exposure to. But now is the time to really think hard about doing that. Thanks, Tim. And Ben, closing with you. Thank you. I think I'll probably uh, just make the, the, the case that stands across all of us, which is we are providing uh, investors with access to venture capital as an asset class in its own right. And that asset class has outperformed public markets over 40 years with a, a delta of outperformance net of fees of more than 7%. And, and that's why it's very important for investors to have some part of this asset class in their portfolio. 
uh, and I think that's also being recognised by the governments with uh, reflections on DC pension schemes where they're not invested in alternatives and they're missing out on those higher returns. And I think the crucial part of that statement is that it's over cycles and over time and therefore people can look through those discounts and see them as a great opportunity to enter into the, into the, into the space. Wonderful. Now, just while um, I give our audience the chance to read this very important disclaimer, um, let me thank once again all of our guests for taking part. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and, and, and the main takeaway for me is this idea of not only thinking about how the EV of a company might change, but, but how that's translated through the capital stack and uh, therefore the diminution of value might be absolutely negligible. So, so that was hugely interesting to me. Um, I want also to thank our audience. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Do post any feedback to conversations at primarybid.com. We'd, we'd love to hear about more sectors that you're interested in. And if you have any further questions for any of our um, guests, we can triage those to them effectively. So um, thank you to all and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks all. all.